<laughs> I was just testing the mic. Um, my name is Thomas Willis. I'm a member of the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, if you're already at our convention, I would hope you uh, know about us, but if not, uh, we're a group established in uh, December 2006. Uh, we organize reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old, 1920s to 30s, new, 1960s to 70s, and post-political, 1980s to 90s left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. So uh, right now, this is our opening plenary of the convention, and the title is Tony Cliff's Legacy Today, International Socialism and the Tradition of Lenin and Trotsky. A uh, brief description uh, of the uh, subject of the plenary, uh, Tony Cliff, who was born Yigail Gluckstein, was a Palestinian-born emigre to England and one of the major figures of post-World War II Trotskyism. Cliff founded the Socialist Review Group in 1950, which eventually grew into the International Socialists, uh, which still exists today, uh, the largest section of which is the Socialist Workers' Party UK. These groups emerged from the crisis of post-war Trotskyism, which had found the once most pointed and forceful critics of Stalinism in the Soviet Union reduced to apologia. Cliff and his collaborators advanced a critique of both the Soviet Union and existing groups on the Trotskyist left through new and controversial doctrines like uh, state capitalism and deflected permanent revolution. So we've invited our now, unfortunately, only two panelists here today to discuss the legacy of Cliff and the international, uh, sorry, the international socialist tradition, uh, including their origins, uh, changed organizational forms through the 60s and 70s, and their impact and influence on the present day left. Okay, so our two speakers first uh, will be James Hartfield, who has been active on the British left for many years, campaigning against militarism. Uh, he wrote The Unpatriotic History of the Second World War for Zero Books in 2012, and is currently writing a history of the British Anti-Slavery Society for Hearst Books. Uh, our second speaker, Tarek Shalabi, is a member of the Revolutionary Socialists in Egypt uh, and is on the Media Committee working on digital communications. Uh, he's a long-standing activist in Egypt and was among the first to set up tents in Tahrir Square during the 2011 revolts. Okay, so uh, the format is we're going to have uh, 20 minutes each of prepared comments by uh, both speakers, which will amount to 40 minutes total, uh, 15 minutes for responses from both speakers uh, in order, and then we will go to the audience for question and answer for about an hour. Um, and one thing before we go, we're going to be meeting tonight at scheduled around 9 p.m., but we'll see how it goes, uh, depending on the length of this event, at the Exchequer for all-you-can-eat pizza and beer. Okay, anyway, um, we'll <laughs> hand things over now to James, who um, take things away. Okay, well, uh, so Nate, will you do me a favor mm -hmm. and open me up that uh, PowerPoint uh, on that first slide? Um, I can hear me. <laughs> the, uh, let me start by saying um, how grateful I am to be invited here today. I've, I've been a keen um, uh, watcher and reader of uh, Platypus, um, and I think it's really useful that um, um, we look critically at the uh, thinking and reasoning of um, the left, because if the left doesn't become self-reflective, uh, it won't have any importance whatsoever. Um, so I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm thrilled to be in Chicago, obviously, uh, but I'm also very glad to be here and participating in this event. I want to say uh, this, roughly, uh, in my comments on the um, International Socialist Group, um, which was founded by uh, Tony Cliff and a few others. And that is that um, uh, I think the, that's them up there, um, the, the best way to understand the intellectual development of it, uh, I think, of, of his thinking and, and the group's thinking, is really to see it very much in context. So if I um, look at my next slide, I think the important part about um, what Cliff's real intervention was and um, it, its different um, facets was that um, he was very interested in uh, an argument uh, about socialist organization, which derives from something that Lenin had said very early in the 20th century. And roughly speaking, in the pamphlet, What is to be done? 
what Lenin does in that pamphlet is to um, bend the stick, as uh, Tony Cliff used to say. He made the point very forcefully that uh, the spontaneous consciousness of the working class would not go beyond trade union consciousness uh, and that political, uh, uh, the theoretical reflection upon that would necessarily uh, uh, be, as he said in the pamphlet, introduced from the outside, which was uh, an anathema uh, uh, to Tony Cliff, uh, uh, which he, uh, a point he criticised. And you can, the best places to read the criticism are, uh, the, well, the, there's a book uh, he wrote about, uh, which is a kind of book about Rosa Luxemburg, uh, and uh, uh, a pamphlet of, which is uh, Trotsky on um, party and class. Now, this is the core of the argument, and it's, it's fascinating because what Lenin is doing is very, very old-fashioned in philosophical terms, is that he's um, uh, derived really from a kind of enlightenment view. Uh, he's saying that, in essence, there is uh, a, a distinction to be made between higher thought uh, and opinion, between uh, rational thought, uh, reflective thought, uh, and uh, immediate natural thinking. And I would suggest that that uh, would be commonplace in, in light, amongst Enlightenment thinkers like Hegel or uh, uh, John Locke. It would be easily understood uh, by them. Did it have a sectarian implication? Now then, um, I suggest not, because Lenin, like Hegel, understood that the, when he talked about higher thought or a reflective thought or theoretical reflection and distinguished it from uh, the merely spontaneous uh, uh, reflections of um, uh, people in their activity, uh, he understood that essentially they were the same, that they were the same su stuff, the same substance, that uh, reflection, uh, that theoretical thinking was not separate and apart wholly it wasn't an absolute distinction, but it was of the same material. It was a distillation of experience. But that distillation was not something that could happen unbidden. That was the very point. Uh, it could only be organized around. It would have to be reflective through organization. And that, roughly speaking, is a point of view which has been um, largely rejected uh, in the 20th century. So if I... Um, uh, this is my mad illustration of the point. Um, in the 20th century, uh, philosophers like Merleau-Ponty uh, uh, and um, Husserl have resisted the idea that there's a differentiation between rational thought uh, and experience. And they've, they've tried to bracket the question aside and, and insisted on the um, uh, commonality of uh, spontaneous uh, thinking uh, and reason, uh, and that th they uh, you know, and really resisted the, the differentiation. And that was very much in the mood of the 20th century. Because the 20th century, uh, in, in all its cultural aspects, has, has looked back for spontaneity. That's why we like Charlie Parker rather than a written score. It's why it said, uh, as it did, uh, as I remember as a child, on the gable end in Labrook Grove, the hippies had painted in massive letters the slogan, uh, which is Blake's against uh, Swift. They said, the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Uh, the tigers of wrath. And it's a very kind of 60s mentality to say that um, spontaneity and emotion uh, is, the, uh, is what you can trust. Whereas uh, reason and reflection is a trap, is something which is cold and distant uh, and uh, uh, loses sight of the truth. Uh, and in essence, that's what uh, the core of uh, Cliff's particular uh, contribution to uh, theoretical development was. Now, many people understood at the time that the, the whole point about Cliff's work, if I can uh, uh, see another uh, slide, was that, they, uh, was that it was very activist. It was around activism, like uh, this very successful anti-Nazi League campaign, uh, uh, whereas the, 
the theoretical stuff was a bit less important. Uh, or, or if I, uh, and then, if I can see another slide, um, more recently, the um, Socialist Workers' Party, which is what the International Socialist Group became, uh, was very successful again in the Stop the War campaign uh, because it inserted itself very pointedly within a, a, a rising uh, tide of movement and reflected those, uh, those feelings uh, that were being expressed in the uh, largely uh, spontaneous rejection of the, uh, um, um, uh, the war campaign that uh, uh, George Bush and Tony Blair were implicated in, uh, looking at it from the, the British uh, perspective. Now, that's all very good, uh, and I think it's, um, if we understand that, it's, we can understand why uh, the, um, the tendency was relatively lively. You know, it had a big uh, impact. I, I, th I want to be a little bit cautious, because to be realistic, um, I don't think the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain ever had any real social weight of a determinative character. I don't think it ever actually changed the course of uh, history at any point. Uh, I think it was mostly influential amongst intellectuals, maybe, um, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's had a, an impact on the life of letters. Uh, but it did rather elegantly, I think, um, summate uh, moods at certain points because that was the, the raison d'etre. The, the downside, and I think the, the limitation, was that there, it, there was a, a fairly profound uh, anti-theoretical trajectory uh, in the way that they worked. Uh, and um, I, I, it's not to say that there weren't theories, you know, we've just heard uh, some of them listed. There were theories were worked up, like the permanent arms economy or Russia is state capitalist. Uh, uh, the permanent revolution has been deflected in the third world and, and this is the foundations of uh, uh, the third world nationalist movements. I think these are all essentially pragmatic um, uh, post-festum constructions uh, uh, to describe a problem, really. Um, uh, so it was a problem that the uh, Trotskyists had inherited a, um, a catastrophist understanding of the economy from Trotsky, uh, which told them that um, uh, the economy would be uh, getting worse and worse and worse in the 1950s and the 1960s, which simply wasn't true. Uh, and so post-Festum, the theory was worked up to explain that. And it, it, it's eccentric, actually, uh, uh, to say that it, it was the um, arms expenditure was the cause of the, um, uh, uh, the restoration of capitalism. And then to say, uh, you know, 20 years later, that arms expenditure was the cause of the um, uh, collapse of the economy in the 1980s. When I say it's eccentric, I mean it's eccentric. It's eccentric in the sense that it's, um, I think the people that coined it weren't really thinking about the fact that they were overthrowing a, a basic proposition of, of Marx's, which, whose um, theoretical work they were situating themselves within, which is that the barrier to capital accumulation is capital itself. It's not something outside, like arms expenditure, that could only be an epiphenomenal effect. Um, uh, I see my time is moving on. Uh, why, so just to um, insist upon the, um, the situatedness of the um, development of the um, IS group and the Socialist Workers' Party afterwards, what I'd like to say is that at key points, if we can uh, see the next slide, they were lifted by events uh, like the, um, uh, the trade union militancy of the 1970s. Uh, and then, when those events moved on, they fell. So if we, if we see the, the, this is also the 70s, but we see the next slide. Um, this was a, a, a kind of a classic kind of problem that they were in, that um, in the 1970s, the, um, uh, the structure of the, uh, or, the, or the, the, the rhythm of the class conflict that was emerging and become quite intense in the 1970s was that uh, full-time trade union officials were clashing with their rank and file because the, uh, the rank and file members were um, basically frustrated with the, the, the slow rate of progress and angry 
at the, um, uh, the fixation of the full-time officials on their securing their own position as over and above um, the rights of uh, workers. And the uh, um, Trotskyists of the IS group competed with the um, uh, members of the Communist Party in Britain uh, for authority amongst the rank and file. Uh, and it was, it was a good pitch, as it were. You know, it, it was a way of uh, presenting what their particular aims were. Because the rank and file revolt of the 1970s, astonishing as it was, merely rose to a crescendo and then fell back, uh, the situation of the, the most militant groups amongst uh, uh, British organized labor changed with it. As they became on the defensive, uh, they rallied to the trade union officers, like uh, the great hero of the um, uh, National Union of Mine Workers, Arthur Scargill. Uh, they, uh, it was quite astonishing, really, to be in that um, uh, conflict, to understand that the, um, uh, Arthur Scargill had failed to win his members uh, uh, across the, uh, the, the mines uh, to a position of taking action against pit closures. And he was in a peculiar position because he knew that his most militant activists were strongly in favor of strike action. Uh, but they were deeply divided uh, from uh, the grassroots membership who were pulling away from the uh, militancy of the 1970s. The militants wanted action, uh, but they couldn't carry the mass of the membership for them. And that was the reason why that um, when the uh, strike did break out in the um, uh, pits, it was not done through trade union democracy, but through picket action. What happened was that one pit took action, it struck it, it picketed out the other pit. Miners are uh, keen supporters of the principle not crossing a picket line, which meant that it was a very effective uh, system, except that throughout the entire dispute, and the dispute lasted a year, was one of the, the bitterest of all, um, the union itself was divided. It was essentially, it was divided between the militant uh, activists and the less militant members, particularly the uh, less militant members in Nottingham, who were not convinced of the need uh, uh, to go ahead. So when the um, leader of the National Mine Work Union of Mine Workers said, we, um, with, it wasn't actually his idea, it was the, um, uh, the uh, Yorkshire Area Committee uh, uh, pushed the point, we're not going to have a ballot because the conservative government is trying to twist our arm to have a ballot. If we have a ballot, we'll lose the ballot, uh, and then we'll lose, or, you know, the, the whole thing will be a disaster. That was a tragic position to be in, and it was the very reverse of the situation they should have been in, uh, or that the, the, they expressed themselves in the 1970s. It was the reverse of the position because they'd adopted the position of the most militant section within the union, but the most militant section within the union were themselves running scared of the rank and file. The rank and file were the very people who were not trusted in the organization of the strike. And that's why the strike failed, because they could not secure their own members uh, to fight uh, in the thing. And throughout this long year, when they should have been going out to get other people to support them, instead they were defending their own position. Now, throughout that period, the Socialist Workers' Party supported the position that there should be no ballot. Think about that. That was a singular reversion of the position that they'd adopted throughout the 1970s, which was for the rank and file, let the rank and file decide. But they'd redefined the rank and file because they drifted with the militants. They reflected the militant perspective, which by that time was defensive. So they really merely echoed their defensiveness, and that was... I'm not saying that, uh, by the way, that the Socialist Workers' Party were the people that defeated the strike. I think the, uh, the, it was the strategy that the militant Yorkshire committee adopted uh, and Arthur Scargill echoed, uh, and tragically the SWP echoed, that was the reason the strike fell. Now that's a bit too much in history maybe, but, but I think what it's describing is that the problem the SWP had as an organization, as a cliffist organization, was that it only ever reflected the opinions of the rank and file. 
or uh, the opinions of the most militant. It never would lead because it felt that leadership was fundamentally an error. It felt that leadership was fundamentally a problem. And that meant that they, as they adapted to each different mood, those moods will be reflected within the organization itself. And you can see it in the most recent events where there's one generation who are essentially kind of traditional welfare socialists and there's an, a younger generation who are uh, militant anti-war activists. And you can't reconcile them within the same organization because they're not actually responding to the same uh, uh, points. I'm out of time now. Uh, well, I am out of time because uh, I think uh, I should draw it to a close there. But fundamentally, uh, to some aid, I would say the basic problem is this, is that um, Cliff was right you know, when he said, um, uh, I will build an organization which will reject the Leninist proposition of leadership. But then his basic problem was that subsequently you had to organize an organization and you had to um, uh, control it. And because he hadn't secured its coherence theoretically, politically, through the pl process of theoretical clarification, it was only really possible to do it bureaucratically. Uh, and that meant that factions would be banned, that um, uh, uh, people would be expelled if they uh, uh, couldn't uh, toe the party line. It was a very limited understanding of party discipline because it wasn't a discipline that was owned by the organization itself. It was operated, tragically, since this was the very thing that he wished to avoid, uh, by the leadership against the membership. Okay. All right, Tarek. Uh, could you start with the next, <clears throat> the next one? Hi, everyone. How you doing? Now, uh, lots of uh, lots to talk about. Can you hear me fine? Or is there an echo or something? Slight feedback. Yeah. Oh well. Okay. So uh, yeah, there's lots to talk about, and uh, James, I think, covered a lot of uh, a lot of interesting uh, topics. Now, um, uh, what I want to talk about a little more, a little about, is the global front. You know, the international. Uh, left, and I spe especially uh, look at it from a perspective of what's going on in Egypt and how that's reflected on the global left. So it's kind of a cheap way to talk about what I wanted to talk about, but kind of make it fit the, the questions uh, that, that were posed. But um, I want to start by talking about this, this photo right here. In 1977, uh, Sadat uh, responded to demands by the World Bank and the IMF to actually remove uh, subsidies on bread. Now, this is part of, obviously, the, the neoliberal policies to... Uh, uh, you know, to make Egypt more attractive for investment and, and make it new liberal and the Thatcher-Reagan uh, kind of style, uh, kind of economy. And uh, obviously, you're all well aware of this. But the, the interesting thing is, is that as soon as Sadat did that, uh, riots broke out. And they're just, they described them as riots because they weren't strikes, they weren't protests. I think they were, it's interesting that they say it was riots because they weren't organized. It was just lots of very angry Egyptians taking to the streets, because, uh, as you might know, bread is the most basic component of an Egyptian's life in, in Egypt, and it, 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 it makes up uh, most of the basic uh, food basket. And therefore, uh, if you're like the average Egyptian, would probably be making $100 a month, the average worker. And so, if you remove subsidies on uh, bread, or actually what you're doing is you're removing subsidies on the flour that's used to make the bread, then that actually results in the prices hiking up across the board, across all the different goods. And so that's, that was a problem. Now, the interesting thing here is that as soon as the riots broke out, Sadat had to actually step back. Now, this was a decision he made. Uh, he was, you know, so that was, you know, more, as it was an installed president. Like, he was the, the West's favorite. He was the new liberal uh, uh, poster boy for, uh, for, all the, for all the international community in the Western countries wanting to control the Egyptian economy and whatnot. And so for him to step back me, shows how big of a backlash that was with the riots uh, because of the, the, the hike in, in prices. And that wasn't organized. Another thing is, is that I wanted to mention about new liberalism in Egypt because I think a lot of you look at it from a bit of a Western perspective. When you talk about new liberalism, you talk about uh, uh, the social welfare state and then the government reducing the expenditure on social welfare. But in Egypt, there isn't any social welfare. Or it's, it's insignificant. What really matters in Egypt is subsidies. 
So that's a little different because subsidies go into food prices. And so it's not about getting proper education and health care. The Egyptians have given up on that quite a while ago. No, it's about having being able to afford to buy the basic food that you need. And so when you come to look at how that's applied, it's different in Egypt than it is in the West. Now, in 99, I'm sorry, can we go to the next uh, sure, sure. one? Uh, yeah, that's when I was talking about neoliberalism in Egypt. That's a regular cue for bread. Because the subsidized bread, uh, at times there was prob- there were uh, there were problems. I remember once there was a, a, a forest fire in Russia, which meant that they couldn't export the same amount of of wheat that we needed because we import our wheat, and therefore uh, there was a shortage. And then immediately there's a shortage of supply of bread, and therefore you get these long queues, and then you get the black market selling bread. Can you imagine, like getting to the point of black market, like spe- paying two, twice or three times the price just to get a loaf of bread? Can we go to the next slide, Nate? So uh, then in 99, as, you're, as, you've, as you all uh, know a lot better than I do, uh, the anti-globalization movement. And it was very interesting that uh, the attack is on the, on the organizations such as the World Trade Organization and such as the World Bank and the IMF, which is precisely uh, the institutions that are really hindering Egyptian progress and the Egyptian working class. Uh, the thing about it is, is that for Egyptians, it didn't matter. Even though this, I would argue that this is... These are people defending uh, the rights uh, of Egyptians to having economic independence and being able to protect their subsidies. But Egyptians weren't aware of it. And I think a lot of uh, uh, leftists worldwide are a little bit too optimistic with the extent of how much uh, the protests, this, uh, the protests of 99 in Seattle and, and throughout uh, different cities actually influenced Egypt. I think uh, I'm sorry to say most of the Egyptians have no clue about it. Uh, the interesting thing is, if you could go on to the next slide, in 2008, this was the first time uh, anyone's ever stepped on a, on a Mubarak poster. Now, this is the Mahalla strike of 2008, the April 6th, uh, so the, the anniversary is coming up in a couple of days. And it's, it's really interesting uh, because this was a massive strike with 40 to 50,000 workers uh, in Mahalla, which is a, an industrial town in the Delta, a couple hours north of Cairo, and they specialize in textile, in the textile industry. And this is the biggest factory for textile industry. And all 40 or 45,000 workers went on strike. And it started uh, by a group of women uh, who turned on the machines and, and they started the strike, and it was, there was a lot of spontaneity. I mean, there was a union, there was some sort of organization, but for the most part, it was pretty spontaneous. And obviously their demands were um, uh, better wage and better working conditions, and because they work, uh, they, have, they live in horrendous uh, conditions. But the, thing, the interesting thing about it is that they made the connection, that golden rule that I think a lot of the Western left uh, take for granted, and that is, People realizing that uh, the struggle, the every, everyday struggle and the, and the hardship is directly related to the political spectrum and the decisions made by the authorities. Now, don't underestimate how difficult it is to make that connection. And don't underestimate how avant-garde uh, these people were because they, a lot of them haven't received proper education, haven't been exposed, probably never traveled beyond a couple of cities in Egypt, and have never actually had enough money to own a proper cell phone or get access to Internet properly or what have you. But they made that connection, and they were the first people to take down Mubarak's poster on the ground and step on it, and step, uh, step on it with their feet and say, we reject this. Mubarak is the reason uh, that we are going through such hardship. And that, I think that, that is amazing. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a, a very famous, famous photo uh, that was for a while the profile picture of a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of my friends on Facebook. This is January 25th, 2011. So basically on a Tuesday, which was basically, uh, uh, it was the National Police Day because Mubarak had decided the year before to start this new holiday to commemorate the police. I, like if you think about that for a second, you might, you might just realize how ridiculous it is that at the height of torture and of corruption and of everything you might hate at the police, no one in Egypt feels safe around the police, not even the high class, not even people who are wealthy and part of the bourgeoisie, no one feels comfortable uh, dealing with, with, with the police. And, and uh, despite all that, Mubarak, instead of trying to reform it, trying to calm it down a little bit, especially under international pressure to do, to take such, such superficial steps, he didn't even do that. He had a, a day dedicated to the national police that we're supposed to all, all celebrate and talk about how great our police is. So um, on that day, 
uh, a lot of uh, middle class and upper middle class uh, activists decided to go to Tahrir. Now, there are some organizations uh, that took part, but this was all very spontaneous. Like, no one knew it was going to be this big. I took the streets, and I was expecting it to be just another one of our protests, you know, with, you know, 500 people, maybe 1,000. But this is uh, a good, like, 40 to 50,000 uh, Egyptians uh, in Tahrir Square. That's phenomenal. Like, that picture was, was such an amazing photo that everyone had it on their Facebook profiles because we were proud because we made history, because we took up almost a quarter of the square, right? Uh, little did we know that a few days later, we would cover every inch and every piece of it. Uh, now, the thing about it is, is that these are mostly middle-class Egyptians who were concerned about human rights, all right, so let's not fool ourselves into thinking like, this is some sort of uh, emancipation or emancipatory politics in the traditional sense in the fight for social justice, or let's not think that it's actually a lot of middle class people who are very angry uh, at the state of corruption and, and, the, and they're looking at a human rights perspective. Having said that, that paved the way for the struggle for social justice because that is what inspired a lot of Egyptians to be like, well, this is my chance to go complain about the rising prices, about the lack of, uh, of, of uh, basic support that I get, about the horrible working conditions and, and salaries that we're getting. If we could go on to the next slide. Now, during the 18 days, I'm sure most of you were following because it was just uh, it was, it's show business, right? So everyone was following the, the Egyptian revolution on TV. And uh, uh, a lot of people think that the protests were effective enough to the extent that it brought down Mubarak. But I hate to break the news to you, or maybe it's good news, it depends on how you look at it, but there were massive strikes throughout the Republic on the 8th, 9th, and 10th of February 2011 across different sectors, some of them very sensitive sectors, like the mail, like the telecommunications, like transportation industries. Those industries, as you all know, are very sensitive to the state, especially a uh, state like ours where the military controls a lot of these, a lot of these aspects. And so when that happened, uh, the military had to take, had to make a move. They had to sacrifice Mubarak. They had to have him step down. Uh, until then, uh, they could have actually gone quite a while with, you know, 500,000 or a million people camped out in Tahrir or going there every day. They could have hung out, hung out for a little bit because actually what a lot of people forget is that the few days up in between, like there were a period, of, there was a period of five or six days where life almost went back to normal in, in uh, Cairo uh, and in the rest of Egypt. And we were in Tahrir camp and we're like, oh shit, this might be a couple of months. Like we thought we were onto something. And then all of a sudden people are going to, their, to, their, to work and people are getting on with their lives. And, uh, and we were not really being very effective. But then the workers uh, went into their strikes, not coordinated, quite spontaneous, happen across different sectors that don't communicate. A lot of the workers that went on strike were actually going on strike for the first time, as far as we can tell. We don't have exact information, but it seems like a lot of them went, were going on strike for the first time, and they made the immediate connection. I think it's interesting what James was talking about earlier, about the balance um, and about understanding and, and reflecting uh, uh, and reason and reaction, because it was, became immediate, immediately became obvious that their, their miserable lives are directly related to the ruling elite who is represented to this regime, represented by Mubarak. These kids in Tahrir want, are onto something. We're going on strike. We don't like this. And so uh, it's, it's incredible. I think it was, it was very special. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So what happened was uh, it sounded really cool. A lot of anarchists made uh, lots of fairy tales about how it was an amazing, it was a huge achievement. This is the new anarchist movement, and uh, that's, that's not true. What happened was is that uh, there was no opposition, right? The only group that could qualify or took the label of opposition were the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, some of you might know uh, a little bit about them, but the Muslim Brotherhood, just in case you don't, is basically uh, an organization with a very strict pyramid kind of structure and a hierarchy, whereby you have 15 older uh, rich men at the top who make all the calls, and they have a philosophy of following a very strict uh, methodology, which is to obey orders, to listen to the orders and obey it. Pretty much, very much like the army, but uh, 
people actually are very into it. Like all the Muslim Brotherhood members are very fond of their leaders. Uh, they're very proud to be uh, Muslim Brotherhood. They did donate a lot of money and time, and, and they, it becomes part of, of their lives. And so basically, uh, because of the way it's structured, it is inevitably an opportunist uh, organization. It can't be any other way because it's a top-down organization, so it's an opportunist reactionary movement. And they had always been interested in, in reform because they were trying to kind of slip themselves into power. And they refused to take the streets on the 25th of January 2011, and they sided with the authorities until they saw that there's such big potential for the Friday of anger, the day of rage, on the 28th of January, three days later. And that's when they decided to go in full force. And that was a very smart move because they pretended like they were there from the day one, which they weren't. And then they kind of tried as much as possible to prove, and they've succeeded in that, to prove that they are the ones in control of, of the square, in control of the, of the movements, uh, and they're the only ones you can talk to. And so at that case, the Mubarak's regime and the military had no choice but to talk to the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's when they cut the deal, and the deal was, we let you do your thing, right? We'll let you replace Mubarak's party and some, some posts. We'll give you a bit of freedom to run the elections. You'll probably win the elections. We'll disband the, Muslim, the Mubarak party. We'll do all these things. But as soon as uh, we're past this point, you need to end this revolution completely. This revolutionary movement needs to come to an end. Otherwise, it's your asses. Because at the end of the day, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, as opportunists, they just wanted the first step, the step to free and fair elections, the bourgeois, uh, the false bourgeois democracy. They just wanted that to make it to power and then to slowly but surely, via their own reform, kind of put in their men in the different institutions, but not trespass the red lines of the military. Now, in doing that, uh, they knew that they would have to crush the, the revolt, which they were more than happy to do, and they can continue to do. Can you go on to the next slide? Uh, and then uh, it was very interesting. Uh, in, in May, I came out of... Uh, we, you know, we were protesting because uh, in front of the Israeli embassy in Egypt, because sadly we actually recognize the state of Israel in Egypt. But hopefully we'll take care of that soon. And um, basically, uh, we I was arrested and spent a few days in prison. Then we came out. All of a sudden, heard about all this 15M movement, and then the Occupy movement, and all this stuff that's going on. And all of a sudden, people were talking about how Tahrir inspired the world, and I, and we were very flattered. Uh, but the, the majority of Egyptians had no clue on what was going on with the Occupy movement, had very little to do with uh, the 15M the, in, in Spain, and very few Egyptians actually realized how much we inspired the world, except for a few maybe upper middle class or middle class Egyptians who were exposed to these sort of stories. And it's very interesting because this is like a one-way inspiration. Like a lot of uh, people are trying to credit Egypt back. There were Egyptian flags in a lot of the Occupy camps, as you might know. And uh, this was supposed to be a message back as a thank you thing to tell us we're in this together. But we didn't, we didn't feel it. <laughs> but I appreciate it, though. If you go on to the next slide. Now, what happened was is that um, the thing about it is, is that the, this, this uh, partnership between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military really weakened us because the revolutionaries are not organized and therefore there wasn't the opportunity to actually present a candidate and to be an alter and have an alternative path and so we, ha we were in a bi binary situation. And uh, on November uh, 22nd, 2011, just a few days before the first parliamentary elections, the first proper, true, free and fair parliamentary elections in Egyptian history, uh, we, the, a, a massive, massive protest covering the entire square. I couldn't find the photo that I was looking for. So this is, this is like only maybe a tenth of what it was like. It was just massive. And this was a protest that the Muslim Brotherhood told every, uh, dictated, uh, told their members not to join. And they actually called, uh, they declared uh, this run by thugs and by agents of Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah and the U.S. and, you know, the, the, the usual bunch. And, and they attacked it very, very fiercely. And the military obviously were against it. And so was Mubarak's party. So this is all of the sides of the counter-revolution were all against this. This is pure, clean-cut revolutionaries here in, in Tahrir Square who all were, uh, just took the streets to, to, took to the square uh, to chant and ask for Tontawi to step down, the head of the military, the military at the time, and also to, uh, in defiance of, the, of what the Muslim Brotherhood asked for. There was no organization at that point. I mean, the revolutionary socialists and other groups, yes, we tried to do our best. Yes, we might have gotten maybe hundreds, maybe thousands to the streets, but 
No one's capable of getting these hundreds of thousands, and no one was actually. No one could imagine that there would be hundred. That there would be you know over a million people take uh, in tahrir, uh, both against both against the the military and against the and the brotherhood. And this is just shows you how powerful uh, it has been. The spontaneity has been in the Egyptian revolution. If we go to the next slide, uh, the last thing before I get to the conclusion, because I think I'm running out of time. Um, Four minutes. Okay, cool. Four minutes should be all right. Uh, is, is we found ourselves in a situation where when we got to the elections, obviously no, the revolutionaries we, and the left wasn't organized. We couldn't present a candidate. We're far from it. And it's kind of understandable because the infrastructure doesn't allow us to do such a thing and we have very little experience compared to the Muslim Brotherhood who have been running for 80 years uh, since the days of the king before the 1952 coup. And Shafi, who was the prime minister appointed by Mubarak in his final days. He was the Minister of Civil Aviation, and he's like the protege of, of Mubarak. And, and so you're talking about uh, the hardcore selection between the Muslim Brotherhood, who have immediately joined the counter-revolution, have betrayed the revolutionary demands in every single aspect, and the other side, which is basically Mubarak's regime and the military and the brutal force. And the, the first, they, they finished the first and second, and so there was a rerun, and th there had to be a choice between the two. And it was a very fierce battle because this, the rerun and the follow-up elections received more votes than the first one. And these were actually fair elections, not free, but fair. And so uh, this, they got 13, and tw 13 million and 12 million votes, so it's over 50% of the voting population. And this is the first time that we take part in elections in such a high turnout. And so... The thing about it here is that their people took different positions. I don't know, maybe talk about this if we get to Q&A, but uh, the idea of people boycotting and why they boycotted and people supporting one side or another. And I think it was, it was um, clear, at least from our perspective, that Morsi needed to win. Whether or not this would happen through a boycott or not, but anyone, like anything, no matter how much they, they, they've trying to prove to, them, to the counter-revolution that they're allies, no matter how much they are willing to betray the demands of the revolution, uh, we would much rather end up with the Muslim Brotherhood than, than the military regime. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So to conclude, this is my ending uh, slide from the 18 days, uh, one of the, the police car uh, burnt down and someone wrote the end, so I thought it was appropriate. Um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, Cliff has a, had a very interesting stance about being equally against uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union when the left was very, pretty divided. I mean, most of the left are obviously very critical of the Soviet Union, but to what extent do you see it as a capitalist threat? And I think if, that, if you take that mentality, now, if, if we're past this point, I mean, it's good to talk about it, but we're past this point. In today's Egypt, we talk about uh, SCAF, the military, and the Islamists led by the Muslim Brotherhood. So you have on one camp uh, the military and Mubarak's party and the, business, the old businessmen. And then on the other end, you have the Islamists led by the Muslim Brotherhood and some new kind of uh, uh, businessmen with beards, basically. And uh, those are the two, the two sides. And it's easy to find yourself saying they're both uh, sides, just two sides of the same kind of revolutionary coin. Uh, but actually, it's not. Because the fact of the matter is, even when Morsi was in power, and he had been in power for a year, he had never reached or even came, come close to be as powerful as the military that controls 30 to 40 percent of the Egyptian economy, controls uh, all of uh, lots of land, has uh, over 500,000 uh, soldiers uh, uh, and doing obligatory military service at, at their disposal to use however they want and run lots of companies. And, and they're just extremely powerful, lot, lots of weapons, direct connections with all the militaries all over. You can compare that with a bunch of opportunist uh, new liberals who just want to replace Mubarak's party but without, uh, without doing much. And the same could be applied, interestingly enough, I'll, I'll wrap up, uh, with, uh, in Syria, uh, with, but this is much more extreme between Assad and, and Jabhat al-Nusra. And I know this is extremely controversial. People go ballistic when I talk about this. But there's something to be said about both not being uh, the two sides of the same counter-revolutionary coin. And now the thing I want to I'll skip to the very last point is say, if, if we want to actually have a global left, we want this to work, and we want, this to, we want us to work together, it's not going to be by the West analyzing uh, the Arab left and talking about the Arab Spring and analyzing from afar that these are anarchists and these are leftists, uh, uh, you know, doing work on the ground, and you need to actually realize what's going on on the ground. And this requires us as leftists 
to know what the hell's going on, and we're trying to trying to work on that. We'll let you know when, when there's any progress. Uh, another thing is uh, not by preaching ideology, because it's really difficult to reach out. I'm going to wrap up in a minute. I'm sorry. To reach to 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 get to, to get people on board with your ideology uh, and and skip the the struggle for economical and in, economic independence. Like to to actually, what we should be doing is we should be supporting strikes. Okay, and that could be strikes that of of workers who are supporting the counter revolution uh, during. The, during the day and striking at night. That's that's perfectly fine to start with. Independent labor unions. In Egypt, we had two or three before the revolution. Now we have 1,500. Um, uh, using the social media and, and trying to appear as much as possible in mainstream media to get our messages across. And, of course, trying to work on democratic reform in, in, in parallel to facilitate the struggle because otherwise, without democratic reform, it's really, really difficult to do revolutionary work in Egypt. Um, then we can, at that point, we can talk about international solidarity. That's what I have to say. Okay, um, now we're going to have 15 minutes for responses uh, between the two of you guys. I will trust you guys to police yourselves. Uh, there will be 15 minutes total. Try to give each other equal time to talk. Uh, we'll start with James. Since you spoke first, you can respond to Tarek's comments. Then, Tarek, you can respond to James's comments and what he's just said about what you said. Um, but go away, guys. I, 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 <laughs> I wasn't actually thinking along those lines, though. Um, and I'd be a complete. You, you raise an interesting point about, um, you know, can we talk about each other's territory, as it were? <laughs> and uh, my instinct is generally yes, one ought. Um, uh, and it's true that um, um, the left has been fractured at times by uh, kind of um, parallel structures that reflect the distribution of power in the world with the Western left nagging um, <laughs> the, the third world. And from time to time, too, you've, I've seen a lot of situations where the, um, the first world left is a kind of a supplicant, uh, you know, yes, please tell me what to do, um, <laughs> because uh, essentially they're embarrassed. And um, so I think on the whole, it, 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 uh, it's good, you know, to, to kick each other left, right, and center, because... Um, we should be um, uh, critical of, of, of what's said. Having said that, I'm at a complete disadvantage because I really know very little about um, uh, Egypt. I don't feel confident um, to say that much. I did have this weird ex experience that, um, that uh, unnerving, actually, with... Um, I don't want to say who it was because it was, it was uh, in a kind of friendly situation, uh, uh, but a leading um, uh, Arab leftist uh, was uh, just after the uh, the Tamarod, is it Tamarod? Tamarod, yeah. The, the whole uh, the, the 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 new Tahrir Square, uh, and uh, uh, and he's saying to me, you know, it was great that um, uh, the army came in and um, uh, demolished them, uh, and I'm saying, well, that seems like a bit of a problem to me, because <laughs> um, uh, you know I can understand that you've got strong criticisms of the Islamists and. In fact, I think, uh, you know, uh, Morsi in power was, um, it was truly shocking, you know. Um, and you can see as well the, the, the extent of the conflict with the, um, uh, the military, you know, their, their anxiety about uh, all these guys coming in that have been involved in previous actions and been more or less unpoliced, whole problems uh, uh, breaking up. So there's a lot of conflict not there, but I was astonished that this guy would be say. I'm not going to. I'll tell you after who it was. <laughs> I uh, need to know who this guy is. <laughs> uh, uh, that um, you know, he was really saying that um, uh, he invested the 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 the, the new the, the so-called new um, Tahrir Square protest with the character of a a recall movement. You know, like uh, it was a popular democratic movement to recall. Um, which I think was completely wrong. I thought at that point, the revolutionary's position had to be to defend, um, as disgusting as that might be, the rights of the Morsi government against a military coup. On the other hand, that when I'm listening to you talking about the, um, uh, the election contest, I've got to say that, um, uh, again, uh, you know, with all the provisos about ignorance, it strikes me that that was the classic um, failure, wasn't it? Because there you had the thing just at the moment when, as you describe it very well, the spontaneous movement is with the uh, is way beyond um, 
uh, the options available. And yet, when it comes to the election, uh, it's, it's back to the two non options, isn't it? And it, it's, it's the inability to get a third candidate that really is it, the inability to make it a political contest uh, is why um, the gains aren't consolidated and why they're still not. I mean, I'm not, you know, don't say to diminish it, but <laughs> the gains are not consolidated because it's the, they could only be consolidated by an actual direct political contest with Morsi and with, um, with uh, uh, the regime. That's the way I'd see it. You're just going to agree now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree. It's just this one part that I don't uh, agree. Uh, maybe uh, I'm a little different. Enough with, it's the very particular, the situation on June 30th, right? So uh, Morsi came to power on June 30th, 2012, right? And actually, what I didn't get to talk about in the, during the talk is building up right after the, uh, the 18 days uh, and in the months, months following that, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were actively using all their members to try to prevent anyone from chanting against the military. Now, from one day to another, they were actually defending the military, and they did not want, and all they did was they wanted people to direct their anger towards Mubarak, because Mubarak's gone, so you can say whatever you want, but they did not want this to be said about uh, the military in any way, because that was part of the deal, because they knew that if this revolutionary movement were to start without being kind of contained by the Muslim Brotherhood, then it could sp spiral out of control, and both the Muslim Brotherhood are going to lose their opportunity to, to get into power, and, and the, the SCAF are just uh, suffering from the, um, obviously, the instability. Political instability is causing economic instability, and it's hitting them the hardest because they're the biggest stakeholders in the Egyptian economy. So that's, uh, so that's what happened. So basically, June 30th was, is, is, was one of the best days of my life, actually. It's, it's very sad to see what happened after that. That kind of tarnishes it, you know, if you look from a bit of a, a utopian kind of uh, individualist, individualist uh, moral kind of uh, aspect. But uh, looking at it realistically, June 30th, you had millions and millions of Egyptians, anywhere between 5 to 10 million. Or the, the, the uh, people were said, talking about 30 million and 33 million. That's bullshit. It's probably like 6 million, all right? which is massive. Have you ever heard of any protest with six million people? And it was like, a, Cairo was one big festival of anti-Morsi. But building up to that, there was, like you said, there were no candidates. There were no options. We did not get our shit together. We did not have, we, we were incapable of saying, forget Morsi, forget Shafi, give X an, an opportunity. And what we had is, uh, going back to what you were talking about at the beginning, uh, was we were trying to stick to a program. And we're saying what we want is minimum wage, uh, maximum wage, uh, better uh, working conditions, what have you, the right to protest, the right to go on strike, the right to form labor unions. And we were talking about that. And he said, whichever candidate agrees to that will have our full support. And surprisingly, no candidate agreed out of all like seven that were or, or ten candidates available. No one agreed, not even Khaled Ali who, who assumed or uh, said that he was a leftist and he actually worked with a lot of labor activists and uh, labor unions and stuff in Mahalla. So we didn't, we didn't have that option. And so we were left uh, with no option but to choose between bad and worse. And that usually happens when you're disorganized, when you don't have your shit together, when, uh, when, you don't, when, when you're just not mobilizing properly. And unfortunately, we're at that stage. Um, and so when that happened, the choice had to be Morsi, between Morsi and Shafi, all right? Uh, how you get there is a different story, but we, we needed Morsi to win. Uh, had Shafi won, it would have been catastrophic, Catastro like horrible. Having said that, June 30th did take away Morsi's legitimacy, all right? A hundred percent. And therefore, with millions of people taken to the streets, this is a big, uh, you know, the hell with the ballot boxes. And this was actually pretty fascinating because we actually started to uh, get people to think that it's no longer about the bourgeois democracy, it's not, it's not about votes, it's not about technically how many papers get into the box, it's actually about the will of the Egyptian people. And from what we can tell with you know, millions and millions out on the streets, it is obvious that Morsi is no longer welcome. And the reason what people were using, that's the interesting thing, Mubarak, uh, Mubarak's businessmen still controlled all the media, and they were very, very good at actually sending out very counter-revolutionary rhetoric to the, to the masses. But what they were using to rally up the people against Morsi were actually fairly revolutionary uh, demands, like uh, the r rise in prices, the instability, 
uh, of, of the political the political instability. Life is getting tough and people aren't being able to get jobs. Their electricity is getting cut. There's a shortage in fuel. All these things that are happening right now as we speak, but there's no mention of it, surprise, surprisingly enough. And so that had people take to the streets and say, the hell with this. We are sick and tired. Morsi is obviously incompetent. He obviously doesn't know what he's doing. And a lot of the people who voted for him turned against him. And so for us, June 30th ended Morsi's rule, ended the Muslim Brotherhood rule. The problem was, was that how it ended was with the military installing itself. So in this case, the answer, the, the answer is not to go back and ask for Morsi to come back, but it's not to, st- to, to allow for the, for the coup. And again, we don't have any options, and so we can't actually say, you know, hey, choose this guy or that guy. So all we could do is say the chance where uh, Morsi's out and he's not coming back but CC is not our president. Like those, those were the chants that we were organizing, and when we were organizing all these different protests and whatnot. And so that was, I think, that was pretty successful uh, rhetoric. Uh, however, we find ourselves in a tough situation, and you would, you could probably try to help me out to figure out what we're supposed to do because if we find ourselves in a tough situation where we can't get ourselves out of it. So all we're doing is criticizing, exposing the hypocrisy of of CC of the military. But in, by doing that, we've forced Sisi to promise that Egypt would be like the new Switzerland. Like he, the, 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 the level of expectations is overwhelming. It's massive. People think that prices are going to go down. They're going to find jobs. The food is going to be available everywhere. Life is going to be better. There's going to be education and health care and infrastructure and, and projects for the youth to get up and, and running. And that's not going to happen. So... If, if and when, actually when the military, because it's going to happen, when the military falls, which, we, which could happen in six months, and, you can, and you've heard it here first, when you start seeing the huge wave of, of strikes and protests against the military, if we're not ready then, and I, I hate to say this, but it looks really difficult, it's a very tough task, if we're not ready then, we might be falling back into this polarization of Islamists, military. And uh, so, yeah, so that's... that's that's, what, that's that. But if I could ask him a question. Yeah, we've got four minutes about left. So. Okay. No, if you could, like, because you, it was very, it's, you criticized uh, the SWP uh, quite a bit, and I, thought, I think it was very constructive criticism. But um, what, what would advice would you give then to this sort of parties? Because you said you're, you, uh, they're, they're reacting and they're making decisions that aren't ex- uh, precisely what should be taken. So the end result is that it seems like it's the leadership against the membership. But how would you go about, like, what changes would you want to see so that you're pleased with SWP? I think it's very tough right now. And, um, I mean, you know, this is all in the context of, uh, I mean, maybe this is just too unpleasant to describe, that the, um, uh, the, 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 whole, the whole association of the organization is so bad <laughs> in Britain right now. And, and it actually, it's, uh, you know, this might sound eccentric, it's really unfair because, um, uh, you know, most recently they were, um, they were told that they couldn't have the conference at um, the University of London Union, where they've been holding it for the last, I think, 20 years, um, uh, which is a complete uh, left-wing sabotage. You know, it's another rival left-wing group that's put this, this point up. And yet they're, they're completely stuffed because the... Um, uh, the mood uh, that's characterised them as like sexist abusers is so entrenched on the British um, kind of left-wing milieu in which they would they exist that it, I, I think as an organisation that that you know the one that carries its name is is really is uh, you know it's, it's hard to see how they'll get beyond it. Obviously, there's a number of um, people that that are within the tradition who are not in the organization and um, you know that they're trying to think about what um, you know what the different uh, positions are and and it's I don't know that I would say that um, uh, my uh, you know the the essence of what I'm saying is that the error is actually or or the you know the way you can fix the problem is not in um, the, the specific policy or your attitude to um, you know the the dotting the i's and crossing the t's of of how you organise um, uh, your debate, but the life of the debate. Because if the reflective moment within the organisation is not um, uh, doesn't understand that it it must to a, a degree 
pull its abstract itself from um, immediacy uh, uh, and become theoretical reflection, uh, then it's not going to succeed. And I think the difficulty when you see the like the RS21 kind of discussion is that they're not really they don't seem to want to uh, um, reflect upon the tradition and understand uh, where its strengths and its li limitations are. What they want to do is to defend the honour of what they did. Well, I mean, it's understandable. You know, what they, they want you know, they, what they don't want to think that they were. Um, uh, propagandists for, uh, you know, some kind of sexist club, you know. They want to think that actually, no, there was something to be retrieved in all of that. And that, that's good. That's the proper thing to do. But I think that the problem is that nobody's really addressing the actual problem. The whole question about what did Martin Smith do strikes me as the least important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's symptomatic. You know, the fact that everything concentrated upon, you know, this particular scandal I mean, don't we know this in, in every other walk of life? You know, the Catholic Church, the Tory party, all these things become consumed by individual scandal precisely at the moment when they're, um, for reasons that they don't properly understand, are failing to uh, get their message across. And at that point, the activists become bitterly um, uh, backbiting of each other. And uh, I, I hate doing this because... Nobody can understand it, and they, you know, they all start pointing the finger at you, saying you're a rape apologist and all the rest of it. <laughs> but um, the, you know, the, if you don't, if we don't get beyond this uh, question of of uh, personal behaviour and start understanding what were the limitations of the movement, I think I, I like a lot of what Richard Seymour said recently about um, uh, you know having a more sober assessment of uh, where the left is, because I think that. That what he's, uh, what's interesting about what he's trying to do is, is he's trying to understand not what went wrong in you know somebody's bedroom, but what went wrong in a kind of political appeal. What you know, where is the uh, anyway? Sorry, I made the point. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, all right, we're going to go to audience Q and A now. Um, it's difficult to see up here, so be sure to wiggle your hands vigorously so I can see. And Chris Cutrone seems to be wiggling his hand the most vigorously, so we'll go to him. Testing. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to trip and kill myself. Yeah, could we um, let up the light a little bit on the audience so we can see better? All right, so I wanted to uh, bring us back to where James started the conversation, uh, namely, um, you know, the, the framework of the of the uh, the panel to begin with. Uh, given the, at least in the Anglophone world, the predominance of um, cliffism as a tradition, the relationship to the earlier history, to uh, you know, ostensible Leninism, and going back to the question of Lenin's what is to be done, and the idea of theoretical reflection, and uh, the role of intellectual life on the left, um, because it, it, you know, a term that that hasn't come up, but that's a, a kind of a dear term to Lenin is tailism, um, and so you know, not only is there the question of spontaneity or not spontaneity, there's also the question of tailism. Now, one thing that did come up that I wanted to highlight was the question of opportunism. In other words, Tarek, when you describe the Muslim Brotherhood, that its organizational structure is uh, designed for opportunistic politics. And James, when you pointed out about how the SWP in the UK found itself in the position of the leadership against the membership, uh, that what most people don't understand about the question of opportunism is the authoritarianism of opportunism. In other words, uh, I think that one issue that I wanted to sort of highlight uh, between you two and maybe get you guys to sort of uh, dispute it more amongst yourselves is the, the question of spontaneity, opportunism, authoritarianism. Um, in other words, it, this missing term, tailism, can kind of connect those up a little bit. Uh, meaning that not only does a organization have to be kind of top-down and authoritarian in order to get its membership to toe the line opportunistically, um, but uh, in fact, uh, you know, this question of tailing after spontaneity um, also carries within it that dynamic. And so, um, finally, the last point that I wanted to make is to sort of offer 
um, the issue of reflection with respect to this consciousness coming from outside, um, you know, which tends to be sort of mystified. It tends to be turned into a sociological question of, I don't know, intellectuals and workers. Um, whereas really what we're talking about is the horizon of politics. In other words, how can um, organizations lift the horizons, the political horizons, of what appear to be spontaneous uprisings? And that that might come not from an outside in terms of a sociological outside, another group of people, but could come from history. In other words, the idea that a kind of accumulated history could be brought to bear, because that's, I think, what Lenin meant in terms of what is to be done, to raise the horizons of what appear to be spontaneous movements. OK. Um, James, you want to go first since we've set that order? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the excellent uh, points. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very interested. I, I, I'm, I'm just tempted slightly to muddy the waters. I mean, shouldn't do, really. But, um, you know, the authoritarianism, there's a, there's a lovely little essay that uh, Engels did on authority where he makes the point that revolutions are pretty authoritarian. <laughs> um, uh, uh, however, that, uh, the, that, that's at the risk of trivializing this uh, very excellent point on the floor, which is, I think, uh, the way I see it is this, is that... Um, uh, you know, if you were in the IS group in the kind of 1960s, you know, you imagine the kind of characters. So it was some really, it's a very um, uh, creative kind of uh, period. You, you know, you look at Dave Widgery's writings, you look at um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Chris Hitchens, I think, is really fabulous um, contributor. I know people are very angry about some of the positions he took later on. Uh, uh, you know, the, as a group of people, they're really interesting and you can see that um, what kind of pulls them together is that they're, they're like a happy band as it were you know in that that um, uh, when they're really a student group um, uh, uh, they're, they're rethinking everything's going on and their their mode of organization is is relatively unimportant because they're um, uh, they're a collective of um, co-workers uh, who have all been through relatively similar experiences, and so uh, when they start to speak amongst each other, that it does, they don't have to beat each other up to win the argument. As the organization grew, it got slightly uh, more different because it, it, it was difficult to sustain that degree. Uh, you know, what was, you know, it, it seemed like, oh, you know, we don't need um, uh, uh, to, to have a vote or, you know, to, to um, crush the internal opposition or anything like that, we can just get on. Uh, but as the organization got larger and it, and it incorporated different layers, you could see the limits of the spontaneous um, uh, uh, operation was that, um, uh, and you, it's very, you can really understand in, in reading that both Ian Birchall's uh, a very good comprehensive uh, biography and also Cliff's own autobiography, that, um, uh, that in essence the leadership of the organization is at war with its membership in a good way, as a, in a way that a, a lively organization should have a kind of a conflict within it. You know, it is, a, it is a bit to, to move forward, nobody moves at the same pace. There, the, there should be a, a kind of a disputatious kind of character, just as the organization is in a disputatious, should be in a disputatious relationship uh, with the mass, you know, that, I think that's one of the weaknesses in, in Cliff's own personality was that he didn't really like it when, uh, uh, you know, he loved it when people said, oh, you know, we're all in it together. But he didn't like uh, the unhappy and aggressive point, you know. He didn't, he didn't, he wanted to hang out with the workers, uh, but he didn't like it to make an unpopular point. Uh, and he, 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 he was always pushing his organization to get stuck in. That was the key thing, and he would perceive the membership as a barrier, the, uh, the established membership as a barrier, and the younger members as the potential. Um, uh, and that's not always untrue uh, in organizations. Uh, but the, the point was that they no longer were in a position, sociologically speaking, uh, to be a singular conversation. Uh, they, they'd recruited people in a kind of haphazard way without it being, without a great demand, you know, just join up. You know, you're, you're active. It's mm. Martov's and uh, Lenin's argument. You know, Lenin says to Martov, you can't possibly mean it when you say any man who goes on strike is a member of our party. Because if that's true, 
Um, it, you just demean the whole proposition. And if you build your organization, as you do, if you're trying to make a mass organization right now, people retrospectively mocked it and said it's a get-rich-quick kind of a thing. Uh, but, of course, that was the enthusiasm of the moment, you know, sign them up and all the rest of it. And then you don't realize that all you've done by signing it up is you've expanded the, um, the line uh, 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 without changing the people. You know, th th nothing has changed in the thing. And that's why it ends up being authoritarian in the bad sense, you know, because what happened is the conversation was restricted to the Central Committee, and it's, it's well described in several instances, because the members were a, a, a chaos. You know, it was, it was like a kind of babble of, um, you know, different opinions, and uh, all kind of, you know, some no doubt very interesting. But you couldn't have trusted those people to, with the authority to make the politics of the organization, because they, nothing, they hadn't made any sacrifice uh, to give ownership of the thing. And that's why it did end up being very authoritarian. And the, you, the, the ban on factions is a classic piece of nonsense. Um, you know, the ban, not that there should be factions. I'm not saying, you know, the very idea that a faction should have an institutional character within an organization is wrong. Of course there are factions within an organization. There are facets of, of arguments. But the, the idea that there's a list that you, you know, I'm in the faction, <laughs> you know, that's a, a recipe for disaster because it's a completely formalistic uh, kind of attitude. I've gone on too long, sorry. Yeah, it's <clears throat> very interesting what you're saying and also thanks for what you're sharing, Mike. I, uh, it's, it's um, the revolutionary socialists, we've opened up uh, membership and closed it kind of according to the events. And I think for the large part, uh, we weren't doing too bad because you don't want a lot of people who are the, of the spontaneous type who just uh, showed up and have uh, little to no uh, knowledge or maybe even interest or they're just part of the wave. It was At one point, it was cool to be Rev Soch. It was cool to be the revolutionary socialist. Um, that's fun, but it but that doesn't get you anywhere. And so what happens is, I think, to answer your question, Michael, I think what we should be doing is, all right, so you get this membership, but as soon as you get this new membership, as soon as that happens, we need to start reading. You need to start getting into theory. You need to start getting active with the protests and with the responsibilities. And the responsibilities don't always have to be protests and should rarely be clashes because I think clashes end up um, give, giving the wrong type of impression of what it should be, what the struggle, the revolutionary struggle should be like. Um, and in Egypt, we've obviously had lots and lots of clashes over the past three years, and you get a lot of people who get really worked up on it and very excited and stuff, and I'm not going to lie and say that I, uh, I don't comprehend that. Um, but having said that, so you want, you want to get, get them reading right away. You want to get them uh, involved in the different activities and start working on the division of labor and stuff. And I think what is crucial, and it's something that the SWP have failed at, and we are trying so hard to get them to do this, is you need to modernize communication and you need to use digital communication to the largest extent. And in the Revolutionary Socialists, uh, we're all on, on uh, Gmail, we're all on lists, we're all in groups, we all have uh, smartphones from, you know, their lower end smartphones all the way to the higher end. Everyone is on top of their emails. We Some committees don't meet that often because they don't need to meet because everyone's ha everything's happening online. We're all following the central uh, Twitter accounts and Facebook page and, and the YouTube channel and all across the board. We're doing this. And now that we've had this digital organizer that is making communication so much better. So it, on the one hand, uh, raising uh, political awareness and getting people involved and learning more about what they're getting themselves into, and on the other hand, uh, improving communication should possibly take care of this whole authoritarianism, uh, authoritarian uh, problem. And that's what we should be, uh, should be working on, I think. Um, okay, start wiggling. Um, Going to go with Cam in the back. Hi. Um, I get, my question is mostly for Tarek. Um, I'm kind of curious, given, given the, the kind of flavor of your speech, and especially the end, about kind of the necessity to, to go it alone and, uh, you know, work out things in Egypt before you kind of you interact with the Western left. I'm curious why the revolutionary socialists have become part of this tradition, the international socialist tradition of uh, Tony Cliff and the other theorists. Like, what what do you think your relationship with that history is and should be, and what do you think you guys have taken from that uh, and made your own? Uh, let me just clarify something. I'm not saying we shouldn't be uh, working with the global left. We should. But what I'm trying to say is 
I, the global left shouldn't be analyzing Egypt from a very uh, Western kind of perspective and think that Tahrir Square was just like Occupy. The differences are immense. I mean, I'm equally proud of both. And, and we're all, we all are, and we hope they both continue. But to think that uh, this, the level of, you know, of politics, of awareness, of engagement, and, and what have you, that happened in Occupy Wall Street was the same as Tahrir Square. It was just, it, it, it's just complete falsehood, and we need to recognize that. So I think a lot of um, the, the global left are, are inclined to say, oh, these are the anarchist groups, or these are the leftist groups who are organizing these protests, and they're really undermining uh, the sp spontaneous aspect of just lots of pissed off Egyptian people, and, and lots of people, and, and uh, we've used Facebook like I don't think any other revolution has made as much of use, uh, use of Facebook <laughs> as we did, and there are more Egyptians. Egyptians are, are the people that spend most time on Facebook Facebook in the world. So we have 17 million Egyptians on Facebook, and we spend more hours on Facebook than any other country in the world. That says a lot. It says a lot about like entertainment and like and the games and ridiculous stuff like that. But it also says a lot about political commentary in that. And that sort that changes the dynamics of things. And if you look at things as oh, I'm sure this leftist organization organized so that 100,000 people show to the to the square, then we're being uh, we're not being true to what's to to the what's going on. Uh, but what we should do is we should be in touch with the global left and we should create this connection but we also need to understand that the Egyptian workers for the Egyptian workers it'll be we're still at the point of trying to uh, Michael was talking about the memory of the working class and of the history and whatnot with Egyptian workers it's a little bit more difficult to say hey you know 20 years ago there was a, a, a strike around your area and it was very successful you know you should you should try that sometime because things have changed so much and there hasn't been the proper documentation there wasn't proper internet and social media. We, we, uh, back then, we didn't exist, and very few groups were working closely with workers to document this sort of thing and try to uh, spread agitation via the digital and modern uh, means. And so that we can't do that. But what we can do is uh, there is a strike that happened just down the street, and it's going pretty well for them. And, and you should be considering doing the same because they used to get $100 a month. Now they're getting $130. And that is massive, and that is your, that's your right, and you should be doing that. So we, we could be doing um, some of that. Now, if you tell them there are people in New York City, no, if you tell them there are people in Oakland who are raising the Egyptian flag in support of what you're doing, uh, they won't know where the hell Oakland is and why the hell a place like Oakland will have the Egyptian flag. And that is understandable. That is perfectly understandable because that is, you don't go into a worker's strike, you know, with a red flag and, 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 the, and your weapons and be like, uh, let's, let's take this mother down, you know. Like, that's not how it works. And you need to understand where they're coming from and they need to have them focus on the social, uh, the economic battle. And as soon as uh, the level of consciousness is, is, is high enough to make the connection with the political spectrum, then you start working on that. On the other hand, having said that, we do maintain a global blog as revolutionary socialists, and we've given it. We don't give it main uh, attention, but it's like the secondary attention to be writing in English, French, German, and, and, we're, and pretty soon we're going to start in, in Farsi, uh, writing uh, translations and original posts on that blog so that the global left could be aware from our perspective of what's going on as opposed to having to call and get in touch with myself or, or like four or five of the comrades who are very good, who, are, who, who uh, can speak English and other languages and what have you. And so by doing that, we, uh, we're, making, we're making, building this connection. But it's very difficult to expect us to have this connection now, but we will be having it in the future, the one we're aspiring for. Yeah, um, Tarek, just one thing I don't want to let slip away from that question was the question of the revolutionary socialists being a part of the international socialists and the relationship between cliff, cliffism, the international socialist tradition, and the revolutionary socialists in Egypt. So do you think you could talk about that a little? Sure. I don't, I don't think there's much to say. We're, we're a, a Trotskyist group, and, uh, out of, uh, and we are 100% convinced with the uh, permanent revolution, and we've seen, how these things, we've seen how these things work. I mean, while as leftists in Egypt, we don't focus that much on what's going on in Europe and the U.S., but we do really focus on what's going on in the Arab world. And you might have noticed in, in, some, in the Morsi slide, there's always talk about Syria, talk about Bahrain, a massive and amazing uh, uprising in Bahrain that was crushed by the Saudi royal family. And we talk about these things because just we start to realize the intervention, the foreign intervention, 
into uh, Egypt and how we need to have protests and strikes happening in these countries to make it a lot more difficult for them to get directly involved in our politics. And so uh, for us, that is the tradition that we stick to, the, uh, the global left, the permanent revolution, and that's what we're working on. But we do understand that you can't be talking about that so directly and openly until we're past a few steps. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Um, yeah, we'll just open up to okay. the floor now. Um, Sorry about okay. that. Um, Pam, she's wiggling vigorously. Vigorousness of handshaking will get you called on. Hello. I wanted to go back to this issue of Taylorism versus leadership. Um, I think that something that struck me in James' comments about um, this issue of spontaneity, uh, you described the cliff, cliffism tendency in many ways as kind of um, giving in to a kind of non-thinking. Um, you basically described a politics of sentiment and in that way opportunistically and sort of unconsciously authoritarian to you know feelings um, oppositional feelings that without digestion remain that and thus remain affirmative of the present there is this uh, essay that we read in platypus um, by Lejek Kolakowski and in it, he describes the left as a fermenting element in history, as um, a way of sort of advancing or deepening uh, a, a moment and thus propelling, right, potentially, a splinter off that moment in a different direction. And it seems to me that if, if there is only, uh, and again, not knowing the Cliffist tendency very well and simply going from your comments, if cliffism is a kind of politics of spontaneity and in this way embracing a kind of non-thinking dimension of like oppositional tendencies, then it is seriously undermining the reflection of leftist politics. I mean, I'm not sure if that's what you were saying, but for me at least that's what it sounds like. Um, I, 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 I wonder what, Tarek, you'd make of this issue of how a history of the left should be part of your practice because in the example that you gave recently when you said you were responding I think to Chris you were saying well you know history of these places is not very well docu documented but I can tell you you know this, this these guys the strike they won the strike they got 30,000 more dollars but what about I mean isn't 30, the 30 more dollars 30 more dollars 30 more dollars a month yes yes and isn't the party isn't the organization in many ways the way through which history can become conscious, right, through activity, through practice. So it's not that you're coming to people saying, well, haven't you read about this or this history, but rather it's through the organization itself in which history sort of becomes, quote, unquote, conscious of itself, right, in, in the activity. And how do you... How do you see yourself? You said you consider yourself a Trotskyist, your organization is Trotskyist, you understand the permanent revolutions, your position. How does this inform your practice today? Um, and how do you see yourself as advancing or fermenting uh, oppositional tendencies in such a way that it can go beyond present spontaneity or present just sentiment? James? That was on me, I thought it was on you. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think, yeah, I, I think it was for Tarek, but... I, I don't want to be, like, um, repetitive... For both, on, for both. ...on the point, but, uh, you know, maybe a, a way to take it a bit further would be um, to, to, to situate it more in the present. The, uh, if, you see, it, it was one kind of a problem to have a politics of spontaneity in the 1970s when the spontaneous trend was up, as it were. You know, <laughs> it was towards militancy... Um, but it's quite. It, it, I think that, you know why the uh, the, the problems uh, you know from about two thousand and eight onwards got so severe was because um, you know this organisation was trying to cope with um, uh, a downward um, trajectory in militancy uh, uh, in West Europe. I'm talking about in in Britain, where you know it's, it's prolonged now the the kind of decline in in uh, uh, 
militant trade union activity. Uh, and more than that, a kind of a really profound uh, disengagement from political life. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it's the kind of opposite problem of Egypt. You know, we've, we've got um, uh, these uh, uh, stale socialist aspirations that have gone bad. You know, we're, we're, the whole prospect of, of socialism in West Europe uh, is really a kind of worn out um, idea because it's not, uh, you know, it's never quite been fulfilled or if it has been fulfilled, it's been a massive disappointment. And you, you see this falling away with, with particular moments that, that clarify it out. So that strong movements in the West today are deeply anti-political. You know, and even ones that... Uh, I, I, I take issues with the Occupy uh, uh, idea. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, lots of very good people weren't involved in interesting ideas. But there's a, there's a core in that movement, which is a, is a, um, a kind of nihilistic rejection. Um, uh, and to amplify that, you know, to, to say, yes, yes, we need more of that, that's a real kind of a problem because you become the voice of this, uh, what's well, essentially a kind of um, um, I hate everything modern, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and... Uh, there's a, you know, when you say there's a difference between sitting down in Tahrir Square and sitting down in, um, well, we had it in uh, outside the London Stock Exchange. I'm thinking, I hope that's true. I mean, it certainly <laughs> looks true because uh, I don't want to be like offensive gratuitously, but um, you know, a lot of the kind of movement in the Occupy the London Stock Exchange was really kind of tragic uh, uh, anti-politics that um, if you amplify that, it really becomes quite a, a I mean, it's just a kind of a destructive thing. You know, we had it with rioting. We had, uh, you know, big riots in, in um, uh, Britain in 2011, um, uh, which did have a direct political uh, trigger, you know, the uh, assassination of, a, of a, a, a black guy by the police. Um, so there were political protests at the core of it, but very quickly it became clear that this was just like looting and um, uh, bad behavior. Uh, and and we're all these left-wing groups compete into each, with each other to proclaim the revolution and say, you know, uh, you know hurrah, the, the revolution is here. And I'm thinking, you know, if, if the revolution is smashing in Foot Locker, then um, this, you, obviously you're right, uh, you know, this is it. And, but you think that it's, it's, it's losing sight, you know, to be wallowing this kind of degenerate... Um, um, Anything you know that's going. We're into that. It really is the most disastrous kind of politics, yeah. And you get the the situation where um, uh, the you know the cover of the socialist worker would be saying Tory sleaze, you know, ex exposed another Tory MP caught with his pants down. And you're thinking, please, you know, this is complete moralism gone mad. They were organising protests about uh, Julian Assange and uh, his you know what he was doing in bed. And I'm thinking, you're crazy to be organizing uh, these kind of protests because it will bite you in the arse. Um, sorry to use the English expression. Um, uh, and it did. It did because, uh, you know, they were just overtaken what, you know, let's adapt to this particular moment. See, and that's much more destructive. You see, it's, it's a good thing to be, have a, a lively relationship to an upward trajectory of, of militancy. Uh, but it's not a good thing to have a lively uh, relationship to a downward trajectory of, of uh, kind of anti-politics. Yeah, I don't have much to say. Uh, I'm, not so, I'm, I'm supposed to say something. But I, I, I will uh, uh, respond to the point of, um, uh, if I remember correctly, the question was about uh, how do you get, so how do you get the people, how do you get the workers, for example, into politics, and how do, you, how do you work this if you're saying that it's very difficult to go back in history and what have you? Well, that's why I was talking about, the, about reading and about discussion as soon as you get, I get in. So there's a, there's a very big difference between, as you all know, between the workers who would join stri a strike for the first time, who would be on strike for a number of times and are now part of a union, who would lead a union, or who would join the Revolutionary Party. Now, that is something different altogether. And uh, those who are, are joining the Revolutionary Party now take a kind of a different path where we start talking about all this history and stuff. And with the Revolutionary Socialists, we do actually have more and more workers joining 
but it's still mostly, uh, you know, middle class professionals and what have you. It's not really a majority working class or anything. It's still mostly that, uh, but it's, but it's, uh, it's growing. And uh, I think that is the appropriate place to talk about these things. While in the, uh, uh, with other strikes, then we should be working with, you know, YouTube videos or Bluetooth videos or photography or, or uh, you know, or just uh, t talking with them or giving them copies of our, of our newspaper where we talk about all these different issues, but bearing in mind that a lot of the workers are actually illiterate. Um, so we're doing, we're, we try to do that. So balance it <coughs> both. Hopefully okay. Kind of um, Gregor. Um, thank you. Um, luckily for us, and by us I mean humanity under capitalism, um, protests do erupt all the time. I mean, the left may be dead, but pro like, there's always an expression in different countries and different situations in a desire for change. But the problem is a desire for change can express itself in different ways. Namely, luckily, more often than not, it expresses itself in a desire for democracy but it can also express itself in a desire for fascism. So that's, I guess, that's a very basic point that in a situation of potential change, the line is very thin between revolution and regression. And I think the mistake that the left does too often is sort of misapprehend a potential regression as success, as a sign of, as a sign of progress, as, as a progressive change. And um, I guess, I mean, this is more of a statement, and um, maybe my question is, if you think this is like a fair, if this is a fair um, assessment of what reflection of leftist politics in a situation of potential change um, could mean, and I guess this would be a very important point, because again, you could basically misapprehend a, a change toward fascism or a, a reaction, a re really anti-democratic re regression, in a progressive manner. And that this is, I think, where the left defeats itself too often. So I guess, could you speak, is that a fair assessment? Is that a fair assessment in the Egyptian situation or just in general? Um, yeah, I guess that was, thank you. Um, no, that's, that definitely doesn't apply to Egypt. Uh, in the least bit. I mean, I do agree that sometimes a, a, a situation that is potentially there for change, if not dealt with uh, properly, could actually cause aggression. But in Egypt, we've just achieved so much. Like, it's just, it's unbelievable. Like, a, a, a lot of Egyptians would disagree with me, but the uh, leftist Egyptians, or at least uh, the you know, the Leninist Trotskyists would agree with me that we have achieved a lot, uh, is, it, particularly uh, if when we reach the point whereby Sisi, uh, in order to carry out a massacre of, uh, you know, of a thousand Muslim Brotherhood uh, pro uh, Mursi members in last August, in July he had to ask for the people to take to the streets. I mentioned this yesterday. I don't know who's, who's here, so I'm sorry for repeating the story. But let me let me just let me just get, get finish because uh, he asked for the people to take to the streets because he wouldn't have been able to do it before that, and what he's done is essentially ask for millions of Egyptians who had never ever taken part in politics, who had always been marginalized, who had no role to play, to all of a sudden come in and play an active role because now the street and the mass movements uh, now that's part of the political spectrum. So we've added a player. We, we had no one. We were just watching a video from afar, and now we're actually, we actually uh, have something going for us. And let's not forget that fashion just doesn't, fashion doesn't, fascism doesn't come out of nowhere. I mean, there are certain, I mean, no one wants fascism. Not even the capitalist uh, society wants fascism. Fascism is a real pain in the ass. It's very hard to maintain. A lot of money spent, a lot of people killed, a lot of investments gone to shit. Like, no one wants it. But capitalism has to refer to fascism in the case that the, the system is being threatened and is at the verge of being completely destroyed, usually, and if we do this right, by a proper workers' movement and what have you. So in this case, uh, it is, you are right in the sense that some people who are up for grabs, who are looking at the spectrum, who see like there's a revolution going on, and they go to the square where the revolution's happening, and they look around and be like, okay, who's, what are the teams here? Which team can I join? Now, in that case, the fascist groups 
might be might have an equal chance to gain these new people just as lo- just as much as the leftist groups but the actual interest uh, what we should be focusing on is first of all organizing ourselves and and like i was mentioning earlier uh, also focusing on the strikes and people fighting for their own rights and going after for their own interests by getting rid of backward ideologies and and uniting with uh, people of other sexes and, and other religions and and other uh, types of people if you will uh, together as a collective against uh, the business owner against the business or against the capitalist to fight for uh, strug- to struggle for a better minimum wage and for small reform that facilitate our path towards the revolutionary victory and so we should be focusing on that as well and when you do that people aren't going to go oh you know what no I'd like to go for fascism no it's just not that you're like forget okay forget the ideologies now we can talk about ideologies all along but don't you think you deserve a better minimum wage don't you think you deserve minimum wage to start with and I doubt that a lot of uh, I doubt that any Egyptian would be like no 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 I'm very happy making $110 a month thank you very much I don't want to make any more than that Right, and they might associate themselves with the fascists, but it's a false association, and it's not going to last at all. Because at the end of the day, the fascists, the number one thing any fascist would want is an end to any sort of emancipatory politics, and no room for any uh, real protest or any real strike that could actually, uh, you know, that could hinder the capitalist system. And so. That's what we need to focus on. It doesn't matter the label. It doesn't matter how people associate themselves. Let's get on the ground. Let's get on the playground and, and, and uh, make gains there. I hope that answers your question. It doesn't, doesn't look like it answered your question. Or maybe you're not, just happy, you're not happy with the answer. But. Okay, Richard, you're... Okay, so um, I have a sort of general statement, which I'd like both speakers to respond to, and then I have one rather technical question for James Hartfield. So um, the general question is going back to the Cliffite, Cliffist tradition is the, the question, it seems to me that Cliffism results from the crisis of Trotskyism in World War II. Trotskyism in turn results from the crisis of Stalinism and particularly the capitulation of uh, the international communist movement, 1933, Hitler's rise to power. So, and Leninism itself, one could say, in a sense, results from the crisis of the Second International in 1914, in terms of the, the real consolidation of the Bolshevik tradition and the communist international. So what I want to uh, ask is the general question of revolutionary optimism and the idea of revolution. I mean, it seems to me in practice, I mean, there hasn't really been a revolutionary crisis since the Second World War that certainly threatened capitalism in the First World. And those overturns of capitalism have been by Stalinist movements in the Third World and have now essentially been reversed. So I think the question is, to what extent can one really believe in revolution in the old sense, meaning revolution that abolishes capitalism as a system, as a worldwide system? And my sense is that hardly anyone in the world really believes in that. And that, that the politics of, for example, most post-war Trotskyism, or the, what is called Trotskyism nowadays, that the politics of the Socialist Workers' Party is really a kind of militant left social democracy. And so that, that's a polemic question. Is that a fair assessment? And uh, then I guess the, the, the technical question that I wanted to ask was um, if you compare the legacy of Cliff with the legacy of, say, Ted Grant, I mean, at one point, militant tendency seemed like an even bigger movement in terms of number of members, like, like, but then dramatically imploded. Um, how would you look at those two traditions in terms of their effects? In particular, that's a, a basically British-centered question. Oh, it really is. But, but the guy who, who used to do the, um, the militant tendencies, the international work, who was called Larby, I think, Bob Larby, used to live in the same flats as my dad. And he was always nipping off to Egypt and to various places. And it's, I mean, it's quite interesting, uh, some of the impacts they've had. Uh, you know, um, uh, Yusuf I. Malala's... Um, uh, was part of the, the militant uh, tendency. Um, uh, the, the girl who was um, um, 
attacked in um, Pakistan by um, uh, Taliban. And it's really quite a moving part of the book, you know, when she starts saying, you know, the, the resolution to these problems is revolutionary socialism. Uh, you know, I'm old-fashioned. I can be moved. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I, I suppose as I'm listening to you set it out, I, I, I worry a bit that it, it's somewhat over-formalistic, uh, a, a bit like being on um, uh, a, a Steve Jobs uh, product, you know, the, the, you're always being funneled back into um, the world of, um, of, uh, uh, you know, what, of iTunes. You know, you can never see the URL. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, you know, whereas the, the PC is, is like a funnel going out, isn't it? Um, uh, anything to do with um, iThis or iThat is, is always funneling you in. And, and I, I think one of the more attractive things about the IS tradition was that they were... Um, comically um, um, indifferent to, um, uh, you know, loyalty to the Trotskyist um, uh, uh, perimeters. You know, they happily collaborated with the Maoists in Portugal. I mean, it, di it didn't work out. Uh, they worked with the um, uh, 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 various sponta spontaneous uh, movements in um, uh, France, they, they talked to the Socialist More Barbarism group, which I know it had Trotskyist roots. But they also talked to the uh, uh, the people in Italy, the um, I forget what it was called, uh, um, uh, which was of a Maoist bent, and and that that was actually it was rather attractive character to them. And and I, I so I, I like I prefer a kind of in, a sociological than an intellectual history approach. Uh, I think uh, to the left. I don't agree that um, um, revolution was always off the agenda. I think the 1970s in West Europe uh, is, a, is a moment of ferment uh, where the real tragedy is writ large is that the, um, the ruling class did not know what to do and neither did the working class, you know? <laughs> and and the, uh, it was like one more push, you know, one more strike, and, and it just, it was like watching two men having a fight who didn't right, really quite dare land the punch, you know? And um, uh, it, 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 you could really see it in, in Britain, but I think it's, it's writ large in France. If you accept that, isn't that an even more damning assessment of the Western left? Well, I, you know, I, um, I, yeah, sure. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, you, can, you can damn somebody once. <laughs> How many times do you need to damn them? Um, I guess drive that uh, pitchfork in further like some devil. Uh, yes, I th you know, we failed, you know, let, can, let me put it that way. Um, uh, you know, I've been involved in left wing parties and, um, uh, you know, they, they don't exist now because we failed. Um, uh, I, you haven't. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm looking out with, with optimism and, and um, um, uh, I'd be happy to give whatever assistance I can. Uh, probably not advice. Um, but, um, uh, you know, so the, I think that is the, that's the situation we're in. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it, the working class didn't fail. You know, the, it, it wasn't the working class that um, um, uh, uh, made the mistakes. It, it was their leaders. Uh, but the price is manifested across society. I think that's the thing that's really tough to take. Uh, working in... Uh, I'm, this is a... a British or West European perspective, because the working class is not left um, um, healthy uh, because its leaders have failed. On the contrary, the whole thing infects all of our social organisation. The very basics of social solidarity disintegrate as a consequence of that. And you can, I mean, you know, I know this can drift into a kind of neoconservative rant about people not knowing how to tie their shoelaces and that kind of thing. But there is a, 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 you know, there's a real problem, a deep cultural problem of, of, an, of uh, uh, a, a difficulty in just articulating the minimum politics of, of opposition uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's exacting a heavy price. So I've been, I, I was telling you off for damning the left and I've left us even more depressed. <laughs> so I'm really hoping the revolution is going to come through in Egypt and... Um, you know, like the wind from the east. And <laughs> we're, uh, we're working on it. Well, we got people working on it. I, I just want to add one thing. I think James answered very well. But I think uh, one thing I want to point out is w we have a bit of an obsession. There's this obsession 
that workers going on strike have to identify themselves as Trotskyists or Leninists, you know. I have no problem with workers voting for Sisi and actually raising his photo, like a poster of his, because they're so fond of him, but while going on strike. What I'm more interested in is getting them to get rid of, of these backwards ideologies that was enforced upon all of the working class by the ruling elite, and to get rid of sectarianism and, uh, and, and sexism and, and all these differentiations, and to work together with other people and to feel empowered in facing the capitalists and then in making a gain and then feeling, and, th and then when that happens, we can start talking a bit of politics. We can start saying, you know what, this whole thing about CC, not really a good idea. The CC guy, he really supports the people we're fighting against. You know, we shouldn't really be putting up his photo and, and ringtone, as his song as a ringtone in your cell phone. And it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> we've, we've had lots of CC fetish in, in, uh, in Egypt. But it's okay because it doesn't, he doesn't, he or she doesn't have to label himself or herself as a leftist at this point. This will come at a later point. What matters now is to believe, is for them to believe in themselves and to be getting rid of those backwards ideologies and fighting the, the regime and, and via strikes. That's what matters. Okay. Um, Ed? I want to raise a question about uh, Cliffism's revolutionary strategy. And one point on which we might agree is that uh, no matter how desirable the outcome of politics in Egypt, uh, any re revolution there would depend on one in the advanced countries to really uh, make a profound step forward towards something like global socialism. Uh, and so it raises the question of uh, Cliffism's organized presence in the advanced countries, in the US and in Great Britain. and. Coming of age as a student uh, some years ago, this to me uh, took two forms. Uh, in Platypus, we sometimes think about the activist left and the academic left. So in terms of uh, activism, the ISO, at least here in the States, were known as the activists on campus. And that, and that seems like a great uh, organizational asset, you know, to be the most visibly recognizable uh, political people. Um, but at the same time, uh, as many of their critics have pointed out, this seems to have a kind of revolving door effect. They, um, you know, when there are spontaneous upsurges like Occupy, uh, they bring young people and, and intersect these, and they recruit some of the uh, occupiers, and things go down. Uh, the, the the political uh, sort of um, vitality uh, goes on the decline, and then uh, these activists end up doing neighborhood work or just to return to the perennial issues of campus activism. Um, and then in terms of the academic quarter, uh, it, it seems like a lot of uh, Cliffites have occupied um, uh, professorships and other positions within the academy. It seems like they've been affiliated with um, Verso and uh, Haymarket and, uh, well, they, they put out Haymarket, uh, historical materialism. They really exercise a kind of ideological hegemony to at least a certain extent um, on the academic left. Um, but at the same time there too, it seems unclear to me whether or not um, they'll be able to leverage that into anything more than just reproducing the next generation of um, avowedly Marxist uh, professors. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess what I'm pointing to is they seem to have this great uh, wealth of organizational asset, ideologically and in terms of personnel and organization. Um, but at the same time, it seems unclear to me how they'll make that next step um, how they won't sort of be in the same place or worse in five or ten years. Um, so, you know, Tarek, I, I take your earlier point that the next step won't be revolution. You know, probably the next step for the left will be some, uh, some constitution of a much more viable uh, organizationally and ideologically uh, uh, left. Um, but that said, I, I guess I'm just asking, like, what do you think uh, cliffism in the advanced countries will have to do to take that step? What will that step look like? And do you think it will be taken? Can, can I just say something before you answer, James? Um, just before I forget it. Uh, basically, I want to add when you said uh, that it has to happen as uh, Cliffites, we need to see this happen in advanced countries. I'd like to mention that Saudi Arabia, uh, for me, uh, for us as revolutionary socialists and for uh, personally analyzing the situation in Egypt, uh, uprising in Saudi Arabia is even more important than one in, in the U.S. 
because it has just a direct impact. Because we saw that when there are protests happening in Tunisia, it can have a ripple effect. Uh, when it happens in Egypt, it just spreads to like six or seven countries, right? And if Saudi Arabia, if the royal family in Saudi Arabia has to deal, has to crack down on, on protests and has to uh, figure out what they're going to do with the police and with the army and, and try to, uh, try to I don't know, somehow make sacrifices to, uh, to crush the dissent, um, this is this would be a big gain for us because uh, you might have been following, but Saudi Arabia just pitched in five billion dollars to to uh, to the Egyptian authorities uh, because they want to make sure this idea of a revolution succeeding is completely completely wiped out of history because they want to make sure that they keep uh, their seats and they're very worried that uh, of the Shiites in the east and of the young revolutionaries in Saudi Arabia and of women wanting to drive and, and make small gains like that that are very symbolic. Uh, so they want to make sure that no revolution in the entire region encourages any people in Saudi Arabia to believe that they have the possibility to bring about some sort of change and that they're not going to be living in a miserable monarchy whereby a bunch of uh, old, uh, old guys control their entire lives from start to finish. So Saudi Arabia is a country that we need to be focusing on as well, besides the U.S. and, and Great Britain and, and the West and what have you. Uh, now, the other thing I want to say is I, I'm in no position, just like I was mentioning earlier about the global left analyzing Egypt, I'm in no position to say what should happen here, but in a more abstract uh, form or more on a theoretical level, there should be a balance between both. Uh, the, between taking to the streets and doing activity on the ground and between actually the intellectual and questioning and having debates and what have you, like what we're doing right now. There should be a balance of both. And, and the revolutionary socialists, we got carried away into a lot of uh, activism on the ground and we had to kind of take a step back and like, listen, uh, when there's something going on, if, if we have something going on, on the ground, we need to have at least half the people not join but instead focus on other duties. That's one thing. And another thing, we need to have make sure we're having the weekly meetings and readings and discussing uh, politics and, and what have you and coming up with statements and writing articles and analysis and reports and what have you. So you need to have a balance of both. And I think if you have uh, an association or an organization uh, focused on one and an organization focused on the other, I think that's not going to be as efficient as effect and as effective as having both in one organization. But I wouldn't know. You guys would know a lot more of how things could work around here. James? James? Yeah, I, 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 I feel I might slightly flog this issue to death now. Um, I, 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 I kind of react against the idea that, um, um, uh, in particular, you know, one or two um, organizations, that, you know, from a particular tradition uh, are dominant uh, and hegemonic because. It strikes me that it, it really doesn't match the actual rhythm of what took place. It was largely accidental, um, or, or you know, it was to do with things that were going on at, elsewhere that, um, by mistake, as it were, the Socialist Workers' Party became the, the biggest group on the left. What I mean is that, uh, as I remember it, you know, uh, way up until uh, you know about um, 1982, um, all politics, all um, militant left-wing politics, was dominated by the Communist Party of Great Britain. And all Trotskyist organizations were completely um, uh, preoccupied with the question of, of challenging the Communist Party of Great Britain and also challenging the Labour Party, which uh, you know, we haven't even begun to touch upon. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's quite weird, in a way, from remembering all that, that you think of the... Socialist Workers' Party is this kind of dominant hegemonic force. You know, most of the time they've been uh, these the underdogs trying to impact upon um, uh, uh, politics. Uh, uh, you know, that um, uh, was exclusive of them, and uh, they've in different ways tried to make themselves reconcile or or attack or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, the, the fact there's a couple of Marxist professors who, you know, had signed up to one faction as opposed to another faction, it doesn't seem that it ought to be that important. You know, Haymarket books, you know, great, love the titles and everything, but it's, it's a little bit passé, actually, in, you know, some of its um, kind of themes. Uh, you know, Verso is, uh, has got other intellectual traditions in it, but again, you know, I would say, um, uh, you know, 
this isn't exactly a Chinese wall, and uh, anybody that wants to do work um, uh, need fear no um, uh, um, kind of territorial ownership of the question of Marxism or revolution or liberation or, or whatever. Uh, I think the key thing is just to strike out on your own because everything is wide open. Everything is wide open. You know, the, the only sense in which it feels a bit restricted is insofar as we're underconfident about uh, uh, doing stuff. I'd say it's, it, this is the easiest time now to establish new... Uh, platforms or, or ideological uh, uh, modes of expression or, um, uh, you know, I don't think we should be, you know, uh, kowtowing to Marx and Trotsky, you know, I, I don't, I mean, it, 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 a lot of this is the language of the past and I, I think it, mostly it's just the imaginative failures that we can't uh, express the, um, uh, the the politics or ideology of, of, of um liberation uh, in ways that are not invoking these blokes with beards if I can put it that way <laughs> sorry different ki <laughs> different kind of beards please <laughs> okay we've got about eight minutes left so I think we've got room for probably one more question maybe two if we keep them very short so um, raise your hands don't all leap at the bit Jorgos, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I would like to raise the issue of democracy, um, which uh, both speakers um, mentioned in a different way, though. Um, James said that uh, one of the main deficits of um, SWP was the um, fact that it hadn't opened the discussion on, of the rank, the rank and file, that uh, the communication between the leadership and the rank and file was broken. And I, w I wanted to ask if that what, what was the real pro problem with SWP. Um, according to me, there was a lying objectivism um, in, the, in the SWP concerning that um, the, the era was ripe for socialism. So in a sense, um, they didn't want the, um, the reflection on the issues to, to arise. They thought that, they, that the only thing they had to do was to support strikes, mass strikes, and so on. So I, I, would like to, I would like you to comment upon this, if there was, this was the cause of the problem of the SWP, if, if the discussion was open to the base, uh, something else was going to happen. And, or was, was it a, a, a more principal problem concerning the, um, the ability of a party to, to, uh, to, to, to exert a certain conscious agency upon the political issues that, um, um, of a society. And um, the, the, the issue of democracy I would like to raise also for uh, Tarek. Um, in West, the main, um, the main focus upon the Arab Spring was that it was a, a democratic phenomenon. Many leftists, let's say, in Greece, we held a panel in Thessaloniki um, uh, upon, this, upon this issue, and there was a prominent figure of uh, the Trotsky's movement, um, not of, of SWP, but of AEC, another, uh, another section, and um, was saying that, look, uh, look at what's happening at the Arab Spring. They are paving the way. They are asking for democracy, and um, that's uh, a, a, great, a, a great thing. And many other, many other lefts, leftists, too, uh, saw as the, the characteristic of, what's, of what was going on in the Arab Spring as the rise of democracy. Um, even Syriza in Greece um, tried to focus on this phenomenon. Almost everyone focused on this phenomenon, that it was mainly um, something that, was, that had to do with democracy. Um, what, what do you think about it? Because you mentioned mainly um, the connection between the strikes and the mass protests and the rallies. Um, yeah, I would like to hear what, what you think about it, about the, um, the issue of democracy. Okay. James, you want to start? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I think democracy is one of the reasons I'm very optimistic about Egypt because, um, uh, you know, those... Uh, I, I take seriously the point that um, Tarek is making that um, those gains don't go away. I mean, I know they do in the sense that, you know, when people take over, they've gone, you know, and that, it's a bit like that. But you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Um, 
can use that orientalist metaphor. The, um, <laughs> uh, Very appropriate. <laughs> you know, it, it, it is, and, and there's, a, there's a great uh, passage in Marx where he says, you know, when the working class advances, it, it does it in faltering steps. You know, you, you, know, you kind of stumble forward and you, and you stumble back, and, and it's quite hard to learn the thing. It's very difficult to be prepared at the right point, but um, I, I, I take it very seriously. I'm interested in what you say about a, a kind of rush to move ahead, you know, onto the social question. Uh, and I understand that um, it's right in the sense that um, uh, there's never a, a, a pure democratic question. You know, it's not a, a, an abstract ideal. But I, I take it very seriously as um, um, I, do, I don't see, um, uh, you know, w w what is social democracy? You know, I mean, in the, the, the original Marxist sense, they, it means to, to give oneself the law uh, throughout society, isn't it? It, it, it? It's a compelling idea. Um, and um, I don't see um, uh, uh, the uh, ideal of socialism um, as distinct, really. Uh, I, you know, it, it's not different from the ideal of, of democracy. Um, uh, it, it, it's to be self-governing. Now, that's difficult because we know, you know, there are countless examples, you know, of... of of false democratization, a kind of, you know, when they, a bit like, uh, you know, just come out about the uh, uh, the uh, CIA's Cuban Twitter uh, platform. Oh, yeah. You know, and uh, you're thinking, you know, some idiot in the CIA is trying to organize, actually it was, it was USAID, wasn't it? It's trying to organize um, a, a Twitter campaign for democracy in Cuba, which no doubt uh, uh, more democracy in Cuba would be a great idea. But, um, uh, there are many examples of these uh, um, uh, uh, Western do-gooding uh, plans to democratize at a distance other people's countries, which are really uh, 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 the word democracy debased and denuded. Um, I think it's somewhat different, the question of democracy within an organization. Uh, and uh, I think it, uh, um, I, I understand why people complain about, um, uh, you know, it was outrageous that uh, these comrades were um, expelled for this or, you know, that this faction was banned. And all those are reasonable points, but um, they're not quite the nub of the problem. The problem is that the, there's this great quote that um, it's in George Lukacs's uh, Towards a Methodology of Organization where he says, I, against all my experience, he says, you know, um, uh, the realm of the party is the true realm of freedom. And you're thinking, it's, you know, all those times have been told to get down to such and such place and sell these newspapers and, um, you know, uh, and sent off to collect money outside this benighted, miserable place. <laughs> it's very difficult to think of that is the act of freedom, you know, that uh, you go routinely on to another you know, uh, lifeless activity or trying to breathe life into it. Um, but it, it is a really important point is that with it, you know, organizing within capitalist society, where is the place where you give yourself the law? You know, where you, um, where you're, uh, uh, you're, you act freely. That's to say, uh, not pushed around within a labor market relationship. You know, not, for, you know, not the, the kind of freedom of um, I sell myself to an employer. You know, not like one of those chumps who say, you know, I think it's really great, I take my clothes off um, to get my college degree. Uh, that's not quite a convincing example of freedom. I think that the point about the socialist organization or the, the democratic centrist organization is not a question of rules or uh, observe this uh, particular thing. It's can you ri say with your hand on your heart that in that moment that the what's happening is that the people in the organization are owning and deciding uh, what the trajectory is. Not in the sense that they all vote, you know, like, you know, with their cards or delegate structure or whatever. Yes, yes, I vote for it. But uh, do they own it? You know, do, are, they, uh, uh, are they living the problem? Are they, uh, do they possess the um, uh, 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 the thing, and at that point, I think it is. You know, Lukacs's point is right. I think at that point, the revolutionary organisation is is the true realm of freedom because it's the point where you 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 decide for yourselves uh, what you're going to do, and then you present it um, uh, to the rest of the uh, society and try out the idea. Uh, and uh, I, th I think 
that to me that is um, you know something well worth aspiring to. Okay, Tarek, last response. Yeah, just last response. Uh, I think the Egyptian Revolution, like uh, a lot of revolutions that are similar, is, is um, a bit, it has a bit of a reformist uh, nature. Like uh, we obviously take this revolution to change things, but we know that change won't come in, uh, right away. It'll take uh, lots of uh, little reforms that kind of hopefully exponentially make it a lot easier for us to actually bring about change. And this comes by having the masses believe in themselves in self-emancipatory politics like we've been talking and, and organizing ourselves, you know, just getting, getting our shit together basically. So uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think with the spontaneity of the, of the revolution, of the wave of the uprising, people were in it for different reasons. But generally speaking, I think it's safe to assume that there's the nature of um, that it, it's a, it has a reformist nature, which is very much in line with our revolutionary aspirations, uh, our aspirations for change. And so uh, we've had some democratic reform. Now it seems like you know the the head of the military, CC, is going to present himself. He's going to become the next president and uh, and whatnot. And it seems like everything has been lost. But that's it's only like that if you're looking at superficial democratic reform as a measurement of how successful or how uh, unsuccessful the the revolution has been. But what you want to look at. Yeah, are other indicators that come as a result of these democratic reforms, and that is uh, how much people have a say in what's going on, how much people believe in themselves, how many people are going on strike when they're fed up, how much time people are waiting. These are all indicators, like how much time workers wait before they take uh, they may go or go on strike, how many people are on social media expressing their ideas freely. I mean, if you were to go, uh, there's a massive, massive campaign on Facebook and Twitter now and it became the number one Twitter hashtag worldwide, which is uh, in Arabic, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an insult to Sisi. And it says, uh, vote for, uh, we use the word pimp, but pimp doesn't have a, a positive connotation in Arabic like it might have in, in American slang. Uh, so it's, <laughs> so it's yeah, yeah, like you could just say, vote, vote for the douchebag or whatever it is, you want, whatever term you want to use. But the interesting thing is, this was the number one hashtag worldwide started by Egyptians with tens of millions uh, using, uh, using this hashtag across uh, Twitter and Facebook. And the interesting thing about it is, is that it's, um, uh, what was I going to say? It's that uh, Sisi used to be a god. Like he was the closest thing to God after he got rid of Morsi. And you couldn't criticize him let alone strongly criticize him, let alone insult him like that. And now we have millions, you know, taking the piss out of him, and, just, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's one of the biggest achievements of the revolution. And I think this is one of the things that we should, these are some of the indicators that we should be looking at uh, on our way to bringing about change. That's, uh, so I can say. That's it. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank both James and Tarek. Um, we're going to be going to Exchequer um, now. There was a scheduled about a half-hour break between the end of this and to get there, so I would expect somewhere around 9.20 um, show up there, but I would bet people to be coming as soon as possible. But anyway. Okay. Well, just go people now. Should, okay. People should just go. All right. Thanks, everybody. It was no problem. Thank you very much.